Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Criminal Law 2, Substantive Criminal Law. Uh, today, we're discussing a very high-level overview of criminal law in the United States. So for most of you, this will be largely review. Um, we are going to do a few things. We're going to look at um, the case brief that I had you all do for today. So we can talk about what it looked like or what it should look like. Um, we will discuss uh, whether the things are crimes or not. We'll discuss a, what a crime versus a tort looks like. We'll discuss uh, really just high, high uh, we'll discuss the, the equations of crime, um, which become a really big part of this course. So this is kind of an introduction that covers a lot of things that will be a very big part of the course. All right, so that being said, I wanna start off slowly and discuss with you all the case brief that you had due today, uh, McKendry versus Christie. Again, it's um, uh, 172, New England second, 380, uh, or Northeastern second, excuse me, Northeastern second, 380. Uh, 1961. Um, if I recall correctly, it's the Illinois Appellate Court. So, um, so I don't have to call anybody on name um, and, and violate HIPAA, or excuse me, HIPAA, FERPA, wrong HIPAA, uh, FERPA. Somebody tell me in McKendry versus Christie, very succinctly, what happened? So if you're trying to explain it to, to somebody um, who has no knowledge of the case, somebody tell me what happened. I can tell you. Okay, tell um, me. He was driving down a hey, road, he was going who, home. Who's he? Uh, McKendry. Okay, so McKendry's, McKendry's driving. And he was driving to lunch from his work and he was followed by a police officer who ended up arresting him with no warrant for um, driving with uh, well, like a suspended license. And then they brought him back to the, he called for backup and they brought him back to the police station, the two officers, it was Frank or French and- Stop you there, last name. I stop you there. So okay. he said that they, uh, they, 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 they followed him and they pulled him over, right? Mm -hmm. and they arrested him for driving on a suspended license. Um, did he say anything? Did he try to- Oh yeah, he tried to show his license to the officers and they, they didn't even, he said, I don't wanna see that. So he had a license mm -hmm. and the officers said actively, we don't wanna see that. And they still arrested him for um, driving, driving yes. on a suspended license. Okay. So you're talking now that the the, He's in the car. They take him to the police station. What happens there? They bring him to the chief's office, and then um, they they booked him for driving like driving without a license. Uh, and then they they did they let him they let him go on for posting bail. And then the chief on his way out asked him for his license, and he showed his license to the the. Either, it was either front desk or the chief himself. And then, yeah. and then he left and he went on his way. Okay. So um, if I recall correctly, he, you said he posted a bail, so he posted a cash bond, mm -hmm. um, but he actually did go in front of a magistrate, right? He did yes. go into yes. court. Yes. And in court, he said he pleaded not guilty mm -hmm. and they gave him a trial date of like April, April 25th. 25th. Yeah. Um, and after that, since he posted the bond, he was free to go uh, until his trial. And he showed the sergeant on his way out driver's license, right? Mm -hmm. He showed him the driver's license. Um, so, I mean, realistically, like what happens in this case, we'll, we'll discuss it a little bit later, but um, so he shows him the driver's license and he leaves. How does he leave? With his car. 
He drove home. He drives home. So taking this into perspective, right? So McKendree's driving, gets pulled over by these police for whatever reason, who think like he's on a suspended license. He's like, no, here's my legitimate license. Look at it. And they're like, no, screw you. Arrest him, bring him down. He goes to court. The court says like, oh yeah, there's enough evidence here to, to have a trial. Even though he's like, I literally have a license on me. Um, and it was so funny and, 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 and sad at the same time, as, as you pointed out, when he left, he left in his car. He drove himself home and the police had no problem with it because he showed them his license. So that was a problem, right? Um, so my question then becomes, uh, what's the procedural history here? You can talk or anybody else can talk if they want to. So remember, procedural history is basically everything that kind of happens um, after the arrest when we're talking about going to court and things like that. The original court sided with the defense uh he sued he was found they dropped the charges on him and then they were he sued the two police officers and the chief for false imprisonment and false arrest and okay. malice uh forgot what it was okay so um thinking about this so what we have here is not technically in front of us a criminal case right it's a civil case um mckinney versus christie because the the criminal aspect the criminal case um, as you said was dismissed right it was dismissed by the magistrate judge um because the city attorney and it was kind of upon the city attorney's recommendation um and there was no warrant that was ever issued and, and there were some other issues that kind of came up so the magistrate dismisses the charges Right, so they're they're later dismissed. So then you're right. He is upset. He is pissed off. I would be too. Right. So he goes and he does what every good American does. When you have a problem in America, you sue. So what did he do? He sued. Right. And he sued, as you said, for um, unlawful imprisonment. And what happens at trial so this thing goes to trial right um or does it go to trial does something happen before that so it went to trial and then the they presented the plaintiff side of the case and then the judge like essentially act asked for a verdict and they sided with the police officers the defendants and then he appealed his case the plaintiff did okay so the plaintiff presents his case of like, hey, yeah, look, um, I was, there was an arrest made by an officer without a warrant of a private person. Um, um, you know, they had reasonable grounds for believing uh, that the person had committed a crime in, in, in front of them, all that jazz. Um, when they presented their case, were they able to show um, any kind of uh, malice or anything like that in, in the unlawful imprisonment? No. No, they weren't able to show malice, right? And that becomes kind of a big part of this because there, there, there is a statutory requirement that there's actual malice, right? There's kind of an evil intent behind what they are doing. Um, now imprisonment, generally speaking, is any unlawful exercise or show of force by which a person is compelled to remain where he does not wish to remain or to go where he does not wish to go. So there was an unlawful imprisonment here, but the question is, did it really rise to the level of um, being um, showing actual malice? Now, he sued, as you said, the two officers and the police chief, right? So the plaintiff presents his case, and um, 
basically what happens is uh, the defense essentially moves for um, a directed verdict, right? They basically say, look, they didn't present enough evidence um, to go forward with the rest of this case. Um, and, you know, that was, that was that, and the judge basically agreed and ordered the jury to, to come back with a verdict of not guilty. Now, now correct me if I'm wrong, somebody tell me about this. Um, the court, how, when, when it comes to the civil case, how did it treat the officers, the two officers versus the police chief? Was there any difference in what happened to them or the way they were treated? Uh, the officers were kind of held um, more accountable. Yeah, Rather, right. Sorry, what? Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Go ahead. Yeah, and the chief of police, even though he was his officer, he kind of cut out there, but I think I, I got what you were saying, right? That the two officers involved, um, they, the case wasn't dismissed against them, right? Um, necessarily. Um, the case was completely dismissed against the um, chief of police, yeah. even though theoretically the chief of police was involved and like could have intervened. He wasn't the one technically responsible for the wrongful imprisonment, right? The two officers were. So, um, but the 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 trial but the judge says it's dismissed against all the parties right at trial does the judge dismissed against all the parties some of the parties no, uh, just uh, just the chief of police the um charges it's reversed and remanded to go back to the trial court for the two police officers okay so what you're basically saying is at trial the entire case was dismissed against the two officers and the chief of police, right? It, it was reversed in part and affirmed in part. So we're talking at the appellate level now. I'm just talking about what happened at trial. Everybody at trial, got dismissed, I'm pretty sure. Right, yeah, so they, they dismissed the entire case, right? Um, so what happens when you lose your case? you continue to sue, right? So uh, McKendry gets a appeal as a matter of right. So that's why this case is called McKendry versus Christie because McKendry is the one asking for the lower court's decision to be overturned, right? He's the petitioner, Christie's the respondent. So on appeal, right? It goes up to the Illinois Court of Appeals What is the question that the Illinois Court of Appeals is trying to answer? Um, I took it as like, was there any evidence to support the plaintiff's complaint? Okay, definitely one way you could word it, right? Um, I would get a little bit more specific and say like sufficient evidence. Okay. Um, because yeah, yeah, like just a little evidence alone is not enough. Like you have to have at least a good showing. Um, one question I, I, somebody had submitted earlier, and it was, it was it was a decent one was whether the trial court was correct in directing a verdict at the close of the plaintiff's evidence, right, as being the issue. And what does the Illinois Court of Appeal? Do? do well, how do they answer that question? Was the trial court correct when they dismissed the case against uh, the two officers and the police chief? I don't think so, no. No, absolutely not, right? Um, 
the the essentially the the court holds like um, no um it looks at at the evidence and it reasons right and and, and it has written and, and it says that there is sufficient prima facie evidence to sustain the complaint of false arrest against the two officers but there's not prima facie evidence to sustain the um lawsuit um, against the chief of police so they side with the trial court when it comes to the chief of police the two officers on the other hand they say the plaintiff made a prima facie case which prima facie basically um means in the law that you've met the bare minimum requirements of the statute or um whatever law governs what you're suing under, right? So um, for instance, um, I think that, yeah, the statute did say, um, imprisonment is any unlawful exercise or show of force by which a person is compelled to remain where he does not wish to remain or to go where he does not wish to go. Now, did the police chief use any force um, or compel him to go somewhere that he didn't want to go or anything like that? Um, he didn't show a prima facie case of that, right? Didn't present enough evidence to show that, yes, a jury could realistically see him as being um, liable for what happened. But he did present a prima facie case that was sufficient for a jury to find, um, potentially find the two officers liable for false imprisonment. So, what ultimately happens to this case? What does the court do? And I think somebody, uh, uh, a male voice came through and, and, and said it earlier. What does the, 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 the court do? Like all the part. Say again? It reverses in part and then uh, reverses and remands in part and then affirms in part. Exactly. It issues basically a split decision, right? So it affirms the lower court's decision regarding the chief of police, but it reverses their decision regarding the two officers, saying, no, there's prima facie evidence that McKendry presented enough evidence that a reasonable jury could find that the two officers falsely imprisoned um, him during this, this, this episode. So that's where they reverse. So they, they change, they, they reject the lower court's decision regarding the two officers, and then they remand. And what do they remand? What does that mean? It means they send it back down to the trial court, and McKendry gets to have a new trial against the two officers right? Um, that's what the remand is. Because remember, appellate courts, they can't order new trials. They can't order things. They, they, I mean, they, they can order a new trial. They can't give a, a new trial. You don't have a trial at the appellate court level, right? So they reverse it. They say, nope, trial court, you're wrong. And we're going to remand it. Usually they remand it with instructions. And the instructions are to have a new trial. Um, in criminal cases, sometimes they remand to have the defendant released. Um, it's 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 a really it's a kind of it's, it's, it's an interesting play, um, but that's that's generally how they deal with it. So um, the rule, the kind of takeaway from this case, right, and what's kind of important for this case and and moving forward in in a criminal justice class and criminal law, because this is a civil case, right, is this notion uh, notion of even in civil cases, the rule really that gets articulated is um, when there's sufficient evidence to sustain a prima facie case, uh, the case cannot be dismissed or a directed verdict issued, right? So um, the defense has to present their side and then the jury gets to decide which side is correct. Um, and when we say prima facie, it's really important to note that statutes list, they, 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 that's what they basically do is they create a list, right? And it says, it's kind of almost like a checklist. It's like, all right, 
uh, did this happen? Did this happen? Did this happen? Did this happen? Well, then they can be held liable, right? And so if we look at false imprisonment, imprisonment, unlawful exercise or show of force, did they use show of force or exercise force? Yes. Was it unlawful at the time? Yes. Uh, which person is compelled to remain where he does not want to remain or go where he does not wish to go. He didn't want to go to jail. Um, and he showed evidence that he didn't want to go to jail. Uh, so he's met these kind of elements, right? And we're going to talk about criminal law is really based upon elements. Uh, and we will get into exhaustive detail about each element for each crime. So you'll know exactly um, what we're talking about. But usually we're talking about like the actus reus, the mens rea, attendant circumstances, things along those lines, concurrence, um, and, and, and what that actually means under the statute. So what this class will do is we're going to take a very general approach. We're going to introduce you to mens rea, and actus reus um, in general, and then towards the middle and end, we're going to look at actual statutes um, and say, okay, this is what murder is. Right? Here's the actus reus, here's what this act means, here's what the mens rea is, here's what the, the, the mental state means, and, and you'll be able to work through those um, having learned generally what like actus reus is and, and, and the thought processes behind it. But yes, that's why I chose this case. This case is a civil case, but it does really kind of turn on this notion of elements. And it also should keep us aware, right, that a lot of the cases we see, it's not the end of the case. Um, the case might get dismissed, but you're going to sue. Uh, so there will a lot of times be a civil component to cases that get dismissed for um, the reasons, especially in criminal law one, but definitely in criminal law two. So again, we're kind of just looking at the notion of there was prima facie evidence. And that's the thing I wanted you to take away from that is that, that term prima facie. Right, so um, basically, there's there's enough evidence to sustain um, a verdict in favor of the plaintiff. Um, met the statute's requirements, um, and then so it should go to a jury to decide. Right, so we're really concerned about statutes um, and, and and statutory elements. So let's uh, kind of start with this question. Um, now that we kind of talked about your brief. Um, and your brief will be graded and I'll respond and I will um, uh, give you feedback. Uh, the first brief is uh, a complete, not complete exercise, right? Because it's a lot of you, it's your first attempt or it's a, it's a kind of, it's a, it's a difficult case to get through. Um, so it's a complete, non-complete exercise. So that being said, let's talk about what is a crime, All right, So we have a, a pretty cool hypothetical, right? So let's say a man knew he was HIV positive. And hopefully all of you know what HIV is, uh, or, and hopefully none of you have it, um, but it's the, the, the predicate to AIDS, right? Um, it's, it's the virus that ultimately causes AIDS and it depletes your immune system. Now, despite his doctor's instructions about having safe sex, and the need to tell his partners before having sex with them um, about his condition, about being HIV positive, despite these instructions, this man went out and had sex numerous times with three different women without telling them about his HIV. Most of the time he used no protection, so no safe sex. But on a few occasions, he withdrew before ejaculating, right? So he wasn't using protection, but he uh, pulled out basically, right? Um, now, that being said, he does give one of the women an anti-AIDS drug to quote, slow down the AIDS. Now, fortunately, even having sex numerous times with somebody who was HIV positive, none of the women contracted HIV. So my question to you is since none of the women contracted HIV, 
Has the man committed a crime? I say no, he didn't. So it was recommended that he disclose his condition to people and it's his choice whether he should or shouldn't, but technically it's not a crime to withhold your own medical information from other people. Okay. Anybody else have any other thoughts? I agree with that. Um, although it's not morally something that a lot of people would do, I don't think it's technically like a crime. Okay. Um, does anybody say it is a crime? You all know I'm very pro-defense, right? Um, that's my background. I say there's a crime here. I say, if I was a prosecutor, right? I found out about this, I was a prosecutor. I would charge the man with at least three counts of sexual assault or rape. Now you're probably going, oh, what? He didn't rape them, it was consensual. My question to you is, was it really consensual? Did the women have all the information they needed in order to make an informed, rational decision about whether or not to engage in copulation with this man? In other words, if he had told them about his HIV, would they have said no to sex? Or might they have said no to sex? Well, since his HIV status would make a difference in their decision for consent, you could make the argument that it is a major factor in their decision for consent, and therefore it could be considered sexual assault. Okay, so yeah, that, 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 I think that's, uh, that's one of the arguments that uh, I think maybe your book makes, I'm, I'm not sure, um, is it goes to the capacity of consent, right? I mean, that's how we determine sexual assault. It's how we determine like rape um, is, was there consent? Um, or was there something that inhibited consent? Right. So one problem I have, and, and you all know I'm, I'm one of the Title IX investigators here on campus. So I get to see a lot of sexual assault cases and they're always hard and they're always sad. Um, but consent's always an issue, um, is, is, is ultimately the issue. But in every case that I've investigated to date, alcohol has been involved. Right. And um, Alcohol has historically in courts and, and under the law, it's been difficult because alcohol does affect your brain in such a way that it lowers your inhibitions, right? So that's why people go to bars and hook up because they both have lowered inhibitions and they decide to have sex. Right, they're probably single and that's why they're at the bar and, and, and that's just kind of how things occur. But when alcohol gets involved, consent becomes very blurry, right? Because how drunk were they? Because you can be so drunk that you want to have sex and you say, I want to have sex, but under the law, we say you can't consent. You were too drunk to consent or to fully understand and appreciate what you did. Think about this one too. Think about a statutory rape, right? Um, where, because you don't know what it is, statutory rape is basically when um, somebody over the age of 18 has sex with somebody under the age of 18. Now, a lot of times this happens uh, in like high school settings where it's like a senior turns 18 and he's dating a sophomore or junior who's 16 and they are having sex and, uh, most of the time, like nobody cares. Um, like they're, police don't care, prosecutors don't care um, for the most part because it's high school and that's literally 
all all of us have ever done in high school was like try to hook up with that like nobody remembers any freaking thing they learned in high school because they were too busy like hormones raging wanting to have sex and um wanting to talk to this girl and or to have to this guy and you know that's just kind of how it is um but that's statutory rape i mean it, it's technically a crime unless you're in a romeo and juliet state Romeo and Juliet state basically says if you're over the age of 18 and the person you're having sex with is consensual sex um, is within like two years of your age, um, it's not going to be statutory rape, right? It's it's a loophole. So that way that protects the, I mean, kids, right? Like the, the high school kids that are having sex, like that protects them. Other states take a more hardline approach, right? Um, and that they'll say statutory rape. Okay, so let's say two 16 year olds have sex with each other, right? Who can be arrested for statutory rape? Both of them, right? The guy and the guy, the girl and the girl, the guy and the girl, who, uh, however the, 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 the situation plays out, both of them can be arrested for raping the other person. Now, doesn't the fact that that they doesn't that point to consent like i mean that that's obvious consent if, if if they both were having sex and they wanted to that's consent but what we say under the law right in some states that you are too young to appreciate the consequences of your actions like sex is fun and all but it can result in pregnancy it can result in stds right? There can be very long-term consequences. And again, I grew up in really rural Missouri. We were actually, um, my, my high school, my town was famous because we had the highest teen pregnancy rate in the country. Um, like all the girls, like when that went to my school got prego. Like, I don't, I don't, I, it's terrifying. Um, because it was rural Missouri, like most of them are like hick and I uh, just they're like don't breed and they bred. Um, and like there's like a 15 year old with a baby. Um, we actually there, there was one report that an 11 year old got pregnant. I didn't even know it was possible. Um, but like think of 11 year old with a baby, like how does that work? Right? So that's why we say like, okay, you, you we know that you guys want to have sex. I mean, that's all you want to do in college. That's all you want to do in high school. Um, it's because your hormones are raging. Um, you don't really have control over your brain. And so you don't, so in the moment, you may not appreciate or completely understand or think through all of the consequences of having sex with someone, right? And because of that, because of your young age, because of your, the hormones are raging at that time, we say that you cannot consent to sex. Right? So that's why it's statutory rape. So consent is a really big issue right, when it comes to defining sexual assault. So as a uh, gentleman pointed out, how does that come into play here, right? Consent seems like a really big deal. If we're saying that like 16 year olds can't consent to have sex when literally that's all they're trying to do in the world, um, or that you can consent, you can say, yes, I want to have sex, but you have a blood alcohol content of a certain level or above that you cannot consent, was the fact that he hid he was HIV positive. Grounds on which consent becomes an issue. And I think in, 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 in these terms, right? I'm gonna have sex with somebody, that's one thing, right? Like, um, if the person is forward and says, oh, just so you know, I have HIV, I don't care how into that person I am, and it's not against them, and, it, and I know that there's shaming involved, I'm not going to risk it, right? Like, I, it, it's, it's not worth it. 
it's not worth the risk, right? You end up dying, like, because this kills you, like, no. Um, so it absolutely would change my mind. Um, and I would assume it would probably have affected the women as well. It might have changed their mind. Um, and what was interesting and, and kind of gets, get, and I want to point out in this case, or this hypothetical, it's actually a real case, but a hypothetical. Um, he gave one of the women anti-AIDS drugs after they had sex to slow down, to what he said, quote, slow down the AIDS. So now we have consent issue and he's acting almost with reckless abandon. I don't know if he's intentionally trying to give people AIDS, right? Because he's trying to slow down the AIDS, but he knew that he was giving people HIV. Like that's what he thought. And he kept doing it. So you know what? I think we've got consent issue. So I think we have this, I think we have at least three sexual assaults. And I would make the argument since HIV basically always turns into AIDS. Um, AIDS doesn't technically kill you. Um, it's basically, it's usually a cold that kills you. So basically like AIDS takes your immune system and just throws it completely away, right? So your body does not fight off bacteria. Your body doesn't fly off germs, anything like that. So like a common cold can kill you, right? And he said he wanted to slow down the AIDS. So he knew that he was giving these people AIDS. So he knew he gave that one, he thought in his head, at least, that he gave this one woman, anti the one he gave the anti-AIDS drugs to, that he was slowing down her AIDS. He thought he gave her AIDS. And he kept having sex with women with that mentality. So I see a consent issue. So I see three sexual assaults. I see at least three attempts at murder. Maybe we're talking murder two, maybe manslaughter one, um, but I definitely see us in the homicide range, or attempted homicide, knowing that AIDS is usually nearly always fatal um, and that he was acting with that kind of reckless abandon to the point that he is like, oh, I'll give one of them some anti-AIDS drugs, you know, whatever. Um, so I see, I see, you know, I, I, the, the attempted murder is a bit of a stretch, um, his quote doesn't help, right? His direct words don't help him. But uh, I think the big takeaway here is consent, right? Um, and really what it depends on, it depends on whatever the language of the statute said. Now, I had another question here, I kind of a hypothetical follow-up is, what if one of the women had contracted HIV? Do we have a stronger case for attempted murder. Or do we have a case for murder? Right? Like it's a prosecutor. So murder is one of the few crimes uh, in addition to um, rape and a couple of others that does not have a statute of limitations. Statute of limitations basically says after so many years of committing a crime, like you, it, and you don't get arrested, you don't get prosecuted for so many years. After so many years, you can't be prosecuted for it, right? So like you steal a car and get away with it. Three years later, police find out it was you, but the statute of limitations is three years. So they can't do anything to you. You're immune, you can't be touched, right? Murder is not that way. What if I'm the prosecutor? I know one of the women contracted HIV and it's probably gonna turn into AIDS and it ultimately will kill her. And I wait, right? Like I have this guy in prison for sexual assault. There's no question about that, but I wait until she dies. Then I arrest him for murder. Do you think that's plausible? Did he, by not telling his partner, 
partners, at least this, this one woman who contracted HIV, did he set into motion a chain of events that ultimately led to her death by withholding the Does fact he was HIV positive? Go ahead. Does it have to be intentional though? Isn't that part of murder? Well, it could Is be murder too. Aspect? It could be manslaughter. I'm yeah, I was, like I was thinking more manslaughter. I'm saying homicide offense. If it was a homicide offense. Oh, yeah. And keep in mind, we also have a quite, I mean, intent is kind of there when he says to, he gives her the anti-age drugs to, quote, slow down the AIDS after he has sex with them without telling her he's HIV positive. Like, that kind of just gives me a little bit of intent, right? Like, um, we're going to talk about the levels of intent. There's actually different levels. Um, so there's purposely, knowingly, recklessly, negligently. And those are the four levels of intent. And those basically determine um, you know, how you acted um, and how severe the crime is, right? So if you do something purposely, it's your end goal to commit that crime. That's gonna be a lot more severe than if you do something negligently, which is um, you should have known better, but you didn't and you did it anyway. Um, but it was kind of more of an accident than anything else, right? Here, maybe it wasn't his purpose to give them AIDS, right? Maybe it was his purpose to have sex. But purposely and knowingly constitute intent. So was he knowingly giving these women HIV and AIDS? Well, he sure as hell thought so. He said to slow down the AIDS. I say you have a case for murder. Right? He put into motion the chain of events that led to the death of the woman. Knowingly. Well, does, anybody, does anybody have any thoughts on that? Now connected to Daniel's iPhone. I think you could charge manslaughter or wrongful death, but there's nothing that shows that he and his intent was to give them AIDS. So I don't think that you could really charge murder. Well, keep in mind his phrase. He wanted to slow down the AIDS. Like he thought he was giving them AIDS. And what we're going to look at is when we look at the statute, uh, we look at mens rea, right? I said there's four levels of mens rea. There's purposefully, knowingly, recklessly, negligently. Purposefully and knowingly are what we consider the intent crimes. So those are what are going to get us murder one, right? Um, recklessly is probably going to get us murder two or man one. Um, negligently is going to get us man two. Um, did he knowingly give people AIDS? I mean, he knew he was HIV positive. He didn't do what he was told about having safe sex. He didn't tell his partners. Um, he usually ejaculated inside of his partners, which is where you get, I mean, the, the most transmission. Occasionally he withdrew. Um, and he even gave anti-AIDS medication to one woman to slow down the AIDS that he thought he had just given her. To me, that's knowingly. He's no, he knows exactly what he's doing. A man knew he was HIV positive. He knew what he was doing. And since there was no consent, I argue there's murder. And we'll get into all the, the finalities of it. And you all actually make some really good points um, that we'll look at when we look at the statutes and things like that. But what I really want you to take away from this is you read this, you're like, okay, he, he didn't, like, it, 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 you're like, that's a really shitty thing to do, right? When you read the, the, the hypothetical, like, that's a really shitty thing to do. But you don't, at least uh, until you go through legal training, you don't go through it and go, oh, he is screwed. Um, because I, I, I doubt that most of you or any of you thought rape and certainly not attempted murder or murder but this is in by the end of this class by the end of this this course i should say 
you will be able to look at a hypothetical just like this one and pull those things out. Um, so it'll go from being, yeah, that's a real shitty thing to do. Like he's a dick to fuck him. He's going to prison. Um, yeah. So that, that just to kind of give you an idea of like what this course is going to be like, what um, hypotheticals you're going to get and then how we're going to play with them and, and change them. This kind of just gives you that, that Socratic method and in, in questioning whether a crime has been committed. So let's talk about crimes versus torts, right? Or, or non-criminal legal wrongs. Uh, one of you mentioned uh, wrongful death. So wrongful death is not a crime. Wrongful death is a tort, right? Um, crimes are where the government right, um, charges you, basically it's, it's technically a lawsuit. Um, the government sues you or charges you with crimes um, and it's a, a public trial and then it's the, on behalf of the people and can go to prison and all that jazz. Torts on the other hand, are how we deal with wrongs in private, right? So don't get me wrong when I'm talking about this. Um, you can absolutely have a criminal case and a tort. Like So a, a tort is a civil case, right? So you can have a criminal case going on and you can have a civil case going on at the same time. Or usually the, the, what most, most times happens is we let the criminal case go first and then we bring in the, the, the tort. And the tort, the whole point of it is to get money, right? Is, is you killed so-and-so, you owe me money, like some kind of compensation that, and there's all kinds of like details that that, that, that really gets into. But we think of crimes, crimes will originate from a list of can'ts and musts, right? So under the law, it tells you exactly what you cannot do. And it tells you exactly what you must do. Torts originate from a list of can'ts and musts. Crimes, the list of can'ts and musts applies to everybody. Torts, the list of can'ts and musts applies to everybody. All right, so we're starting out and you see that the tort law really did originate from the criminal law because they are so closely um, related. Then we start to deviate just a little bit. We say crimes injure another individual and the whole community. That's why it's usually the state or United States versus somebody because the community has been injured. You kill somebody, you've injured that person, but you injured the community and the victim is the community. Torts injure, injure another individual and the whole community as well, but the focus is not on the community. The focus is on the individual. Now, Criminal prosecutions, as we said before, are brought by the state or the federal government against individuals. Torts are private parties bringing tort actions against other parties. So this is where you think about like somebody sues somebody. Usually it's gonna be a tort. I mean, I mean, kind of like breach of contract or anything like that, but for our purposes, it's a tort. Um, crimes, convicted felons pay money to the state or serve time in custody of the state. Torts, defendants who lose the tort case pay money to the plaintiff who sued. So you cannot sue somebody and have them go to prison. Only the government can, right? Criminal conviction is a condemnation by the whole community that express the, the expression of its hatred, fear, or contempt for the convict, right? So that's why it's always the people or the state or United States versus like, it, it's, it's the community saying, you harmed our community. Tort, on the other hand, it just awards compensation to the plaintiff who brought the lawsuit. Um, now, there are things like punitive damages where we do kind of get into the hatred, fear, and contempt. But, you know, for our purposes, it's just we're focused on trying to get the plaintiff, the individual who brought the tort, as whole as possible. Crimes, the state has to prove all elements beyond a reasonable doubt, right? And we'll look at the spectrum later of beyond a reasonable doubt. But if we think of a line from zero to 100 of, of certainty, zero on the left, 0% uh, certainty somebody did something. On the right, 100% certainty somebody did something, okay? 
beyond a reasonable doubt is a little bit to the left or the right. So it, it's about 95, like 95% 95 sure somebody did something. Um, that's a really high bar to meet. It doesn't mean you're absolutely convinced or, or that you don't have any doubts. Um, I used this example in my last course. Uh, hypothetically, is it possible that an alien could come down, clone your DNA, go rob a 7-Eleven uh, with get a Red Bull and like five dollars in lottery tickets, come back, unclone your his DNA, get into a spacecraft, and fly off? Is that possible? Theoretically, yes. Right. So that means we could never be hundred percent sure because that situation could happen. Is it reasonable? No. And that's where the term reasonable doubt comes in. It's like you might have all the doubt in the world. Like you can doubt all kinds of things. But do you have to ask yourself, is it really reasonable to think that? If it is reasonable that you, uh, you doubt this person did it and you have a, a good reason for it or you have at least some reason for it, um, then they haven't proved their, all the elements beyond a reasonable doubt. Right? And, and theoretically, the person would be not guilty. Um, they have to prove every element beyond a reasonable doubt. So every element at 95% or higher um, to a jury. And there's lots of elements in criminal cases. In torts, the burden is on the plaintiff, so the person bringing in the lawsuit, to prove responsibility right, for the injury, the private wrong, by it was called a preponderance of the evidence. Right? A preponderance of the evidence. So if we think about our line from 0% certain to 100% certain, beyond a reasonable doubt is sitting at about 95. Preponderance of the evidence is at 50.01% or 51% or 50% in a feather, however you want to word it, however you want to think about it but just a tiny fraction of a molecule over 50% is enough. So if we're going to take away your liberty, we have to do 95%. If we're going to make you pay somebody money for something that you did, they just have to show that you did it. It's more likely than not that you did it. Like that's all they have to show, is it's more likely than not that you committed the tort. And that's why people get so upset about torts, and, and that's why like people get sued all the time, is because it's such a low standard. Right? All I have to do is show it's more likely than not that you committed the elements of the tort. That's it. Um, and so the reason that we usually let crime criminal cases go first, at least as a, as a lawyer, I would let a criminal case go first, is because Evidence is going to come out in the criminal case that you might not be able to get in the tort case. And if the state finds the person guilty beyond all reasonable doubt and he gets sentenced to prison, guess what a civil jury is going to do? They're going to be like, well, we have to find by 50.01% that this person did it or didn't do it. But another court has already found at 95% sure the person did it. We're just going to follow what they did, right? So that's why um, when we think about like the uh, famous case, O.J. Simpson, O.J. Simpson um, was acquitted, was found not guilty of the, 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 the two murders of which he was charged, right? He was, however, after the case, sued for wrongful death. He was found liable. He had to pay millions to the families of um, the people he supposedly killed, right? So um, that's kind of how it usually proceeds. Is there's a crime, then there's a tort. Um, you can also do torts without ever, I mean, a, a tort can be a crime and you could just never report the crime and just sue somebody, right? Like um, theoretically you could, I could walk up and punch you in the face. You could call the police and have me arrested. Or, and I should say, and or, um, maybe you don't want to deal with the police. You don't want to deal with all that. But I really hurt your jaw, and you're 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 not happy about it. So what do you do? Is you fill out a form, and you sue me, right? 
to um, essentially make you whole, to, to right my wrong, that's fine, right? Like you don't have to call the police. As long as you have enough evidence to a prima facie case, like that's fine. Um, so when we go through the crimes that we'll look at later in the term, I want you to be thinking about that, thinking, um, okay, so this could be a private lawsuit as well. Uh, what would the private law, like, and, and it tried to distinguish between the two, right? Um, our focus in this course is crimes, but just know that like there are torts that can come up. We won't get into tort law because tort law is a whole other issue. Um, but we're focusing on the, the left portion of your screen, we're focusing on crimes. So let's talk about the classification of crimes, right? So crimes are classified, at least in the 13th century, right? Its origins were in the 13th century. So the 1200s, there were two types of crimes. And you probably heard this if you've ever watched Legally Blonde. There are malum in se offenses and there are malum prohibitum offenses. Let's start with the bottom one. Malum prohibitum. What this translates to roughly from the Latin is wrong due to being prohibited. Right? Wrong due to being prohibited. That's the type of offense. What this means is this offense is only criminal because it's prohibited by law. Right? So um, We'll get to the, the other bullet points in a minute. We'll, we'll get to the next bullet point now. Um, generally, we don't require criminal intent for malum prohibitum offenses. Only a voluntary act. That is still true to this day. In order to have a crime, you have to have, we well, have to meet what's called the voluntary act rule. Right? You have to have committed an act voluntarily. That's it. It may not have been your intent to murder. You may not have thought about it that way. But if it's a malprohibitum, which is going to be less serious, um, as long as you did it voluntarily, like nobody was forcing you to do it, you're guilty of it. Right? So when we think about malprohibitum, it's just wrong due to being prohibited. Think about something like speeding. Is there anything that's like inherently evil about speeding? No, like it's just, it's a, it's a, theoretically it's for safety, but really it's a, it's a freaking arbitrary number, right? That they say, if you go, if, if your car number goes above this number, then we're going to pull you over and you get like a $200 ticket. Um, so you got to stay below this number. If you decide to speed, so you're out on, on, on the highway out here and you decide to speed, or you don't realize really how fast you're going. Um, you're passing cars, but you, you don't, you're not looking at your speedometer, which is real stupid, but like you, whatever people do it. Um, as long as you had that, your foot on the gas voluntarily, you're guilty, regardless of your intent. Even if it wasn't a speed, maybe your intent was to go as slow as possible, but you were speeding. Um, unless somebody in the car was pushing your leg down onto the accelerator, which would make your act involuntary, you're guilty, All right? Think of something also like public intoxication. Is there anything inherently evil or inherently wrong about being intoxicated in public? No. We don't like it for a couple of reasons. One, it, it does pose a safety issue to the, usually to the person who's drunk. Uh, if they're walking around and they're crossing streets, like well, they're gonna get hit by a car because they're fucking idiots. Um, but two, it's annoying. Like you ever had like dinner at a decent restaurant and like table next to you, like they're just getting shit canned and it's just, they're just annoying as hell. Um, that's why we have public intoxication. Um, it's because we have the safety issue, but we also have it's just annoying, right? It's not wrong in of it itself. You're not an evil person if you drink in public or, or go out in public intoxicated. Um, 
I know I did in college quite a bit. Um, and I don't consider myself evil. Like I don't have a soul, but like I don't consider myself self evil. Um, but yes, and 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 you could theoretically not go out in public voluntarily. Um, but as long as you inter intelligently and and and, and, and tell, excuse me, and as long as you intended and voluntarily, um, not even intended, as long as you voluntarily started drinking, everything after that doesn't matter. All we need is one voluntary act, right? So you were voluntarily drinking and you got thrown out of the bar. You're now on the sidewalk, drunk. You're drunk in public. Did you want to be in public? No. Do you want to drink? Yep. There's your act, right? So it's wrong just because the law says it's wrong, right? The freaking arbitrary speed speed limit, like it's it's just there. I mean, hell, the Audubon doesn't have a speed limit, right? You can go as fast as you want on that sucker. It's actually one of the safest roads in the world, um, whereas ours are the most dangerous in the world. Um, and so it's an arbitrary number. Right, it, 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 it's just wrong because the state says it's wrong. We compare that, however, to malum in se offenses, right? Malum in se translates roughly into evil in itself. So these are offenses in which the law does not um, need necessarily to characterize conduct as wrong. Right, um, it's something that we as human beings all agree. I mean, for the most part, agree and, and inherently feel inside of us is the wrong thing to do. Right. So most of us, not me, but most of us have a conscience. Right, and we weigh our actions, or we feel bad about our actions, or there's some things that we just won't do because we think it's wrong. And it's not because we're considered about what the state says. We don't, we don't care what the model penal code says. We feel it's wrong. It's just wrong. It's wrong in and of itself. All right. So this is things like murder. Like, why don't I, I want to, but like, why don't I murder those people on the damn highway who drive 65 in the passing lane? Because I feel it's inherently wrong. Well, theoretically, I feel it's inherently wrong, right, to murder them. Um, another one that we consider morally wrong, inherently wrong, is rape. We don't need the government to tell us that rape is fucking evil, right? A um, little less serious, but still we all pretty much agree, robbery. Taking something that doesn't belong to you is wrong, right? We don't need the government to tell us it's wrong. So when we look at the 13th century, they would classify offenses into these two categories, right? And then legally blonde, um, just to explain the, 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 the part of it in legally blonde, um, the professor asked, would you rather have a client who committed a crime malum in se or malum prohibitum? And like the um, brunette bitch raises her hand and she's like, uh, malum prohibitum, because that way he would have committed a regulatory infraction instead of a serious felony, right? And then L. Woods is like, like the competition to the, like the bitch blonde or the bitch brunette and is like, mm, uh, raises her hand and she's like, mm, no, I'd rather have uh, the <laughs> malum in say one. Uh, Oh, what should I say? Oh, because I, I, I like the challenge or something like that. Um, but I mean, it's just to get back to the brunette. But that's what they're talking about. They're just, the, the, they're talking about these arbitrary, well, not really arbitrary, but these classifications that originated in the 13th century. Now they have evolved and you're going to see, it's, it's, it's going to click here in about five seconds. We have two modern classifications of crimes and you've heard of these. We have felonies, and we have misdemeanors, right? Felonies are punishable by one or more years in prison 
or death, right? So a year or more in prison or death, usually more than like $25,000 or some along those lines. So like, that's how we distinguish um, felonies, right? More than a year in prison. So even like a, a year and a day, that's a felony. A year is a jail and it's, it's a misdemeanor, but a year and a day is a felony. We, so we, we, we categorize it by kind of the punishment we impose. Now there are two sub classifications. There are felonies against persons. So this includes murder, manslaughter, rape, kidnapping, robbery. Wow, that sounds really familiar. Felonies about murder and rape and robbery. It's almost as if we took malum in say and called it felonies and took malum prohibitum and called them misdemeanors. Almost. And then we also have felonies against property, right? So felony theft, arson, and burglary. Now, if we look at misdemeanors, misdemeanors are usually punished by less than a year in jail or a year or less in jail. Um, generally, misdemeanors fall within what's called the police power of the state. Um, so what this basically does is it allows the government to make and enforce laws that further public safety, that further the public economy, that provide protections for public property, that emphasize, and this is a, the controversial one and the one that I hate, public morals and public health, right? So think about somebody who is drinking in public and is intoxicated in public. Are they a threat to public safety? Yeah, potentially, but probably not. Uh, public health, yeah, you can make the argument, probably not. What are we after them? Are they there for the economy? Probably not. Are they there for public property? Probably not. That leaves us public morals. And that's the state telling us what is moral and immoral. And that usually is a decision that should be left up to the individual. Or the individual should act in a moral way according to their moral beliefs. So misdemeanors are really um, the government controlling and telling you what is moral and immoral. Like felonies, we all agree. Like, because mal felonies are malum in se. Like, we all agree they're wrong in and of themselves. Like, at no point would I, could, could you ever defend rape? Could you ever say, oh yeah, no, it was, it was moral in this case. No, never, ever, 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 ever. Misdemeanors. It's just malum prohibitum. It's just wrong because the state tells me it's wrong. Like, the state, whoever's in charge, right, is, doesn't believe in drinking or doesn't believe you should be allowed to be drunk in public because it looks bad or something like that. So they're making it illegal. It's the government telling you what they think is right and what they think is wrong. Think about that. So that being said, let's give some uh, different examples. Um, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm actually to read these, uh, and I'll read them to you just you know fairly fairly quickly, um, and answer the question: Is it a felony or is it a misdemeanor? All right. Um, so read the following scenarios to determine what level of offense was committed. So a 20 year old male was sentenced to 15 months in prison. Is this a misdemeanor or a felony? Felony. Felony, absolutely. 36 year old female was released from jail after serving her entire 280 day sentence. Misdemeanor. Misdemeanor, absolutely. 27 year old female appeared before court and was informed if convicted of the offense she had been charged with, she could serve no more than 365 days in jail if convicted. Misdemeanor. Misdemeanor, absolutely. 45-year-old male was released from custody after serving 48-month sentence. Felony. Felony. 55-year-old male was ordered to pay a fine of $300. If he does not pay, he will have to serve 90 days in jail. Misdemeanor. Misdemeanor, right? You, you nailed him. Um, we determine it by the sentence, right? More than a year. You are in prison, you've committed a felony. Less than a year, it's a misdemeanor, you're in jail, right? Jails and prisons, different things. Um, 
So when we think about like people in the county jail, yeah, most of them are there waiting trial or awaiting a bed in a prison to open up or whatever. But a lot of them are also there because that's their sentence, right? Like that, that's where there's the sermon of the sentence. They, for a DUI, assuming it's not like your third one, which is usually a felony, um, usually your first like two DUIs are misdemeanors. Um, but let's say you get a judge who hammers you on it, you're going to go to the county jail. And that's where you're going to serve your sentence. It's just in the county jail. You're not going to go on the hill. You're not going to go through that whole system. You're just going to go to the jail. And I, and I don't say it like that in the sense um, jails can actually be worse than prisons. They can be more dangerous. They don't have the classification system necessarily that prisons do and things like that. Um, also, people would rather be in prison usually than a jail if they're going to be there a long time because jails don't have programs so they don't usually have like ged programs or college programs or um, trade programs to learn a skill they usually don't have that like they don't even usually have libraries prisons do right so there's ways to pass the time and, and theoretically self-improve so again we differentiate between a misdemeanor and a felony based upon the sentence so let's quickly look at sources of law Right. So when we look at sources of law, there's really kind of three sources that we, 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 we take into account. Right. Um, the first and the most solid and the one that is like the most governing is the U.S. criminal or is our statutes. So that's when we think about laws. Right. That's what um, Congress passes or the state legislature or state assembly, however you want to call it, passes laws. Right. That say um, you can't do X, Y and Z. You can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do that, right? Those, that's law. I mean, that, that, that's what we generally think about, right? So when we think about it, there are different levels, right? So there's the U.S. Code, so U.S. Criminal Code, USC. There's a link to it. You can look at it if you want. Um, that's the federal level, right? So the feds, the Congress passes and makes the, the U.S. Criminal Code. Then there is the laws of new york right that's the state criminal code the state assembly passes those laws then there are municipal ordinances so those are laws that the city or the county passes that you have to abide by so at any given time you have to follow and you're supposed to know like you are we assume that you know like as a matter of law that you have to follow everything in the U.S. code, you have to follow the whole state code that you're in, and you have to abide by all the municipal ordinances at the same time, right? So right now, you sitting wherever you are, you're governed by at least three separate sets of laws. So kind of take that into account. Um, it, it's interesting. And the laws can vary. I mean, they can, uh, state to state, the laws can vary. And then we'll talk about fluctuation and things like that. Um, one thing I, I like to mention is the model penal code. And I have a copy of it if, if you want it. It's actually hard to get your hands on. Um, model penal code basically is, um, it derives from a group of legal scholars. So a group of legal scholars comes together like a couple times a year um, and they develop model codes, right? So people who are experts in criminal law come together and they develop the model penal code. Um, and what this is, is it's the ideal code, right? Like they're like, so they don't have legislatures, they don't have constituents, they're, they're just private citizens who, who are invited and they come and they debate and they discuss these and they come up with, all right, what is the model penal? Like, what should the law of the land be? If we lived in an ideal world, what would the laws be? And what we've seen is states, even the U.S. Code has done it to some extent, but states especially have started to follow the model penal code, right? So you'll see it abbreviated throughout um, the rest of this course as MPC. And we will be using the model penal code when we break down what is a murder, when we break down what is a rape, um, the elements of that, we'll be using the model penal code throughout this class. There's a link to it if you want to take a look at it. Um, definitely, definitely take a look at it. There's also administrative laws and regulations, 
right? So agencies like the EPA, the SEC, and EPA's Environmental Protection Agency, the Security Exchange Commission, um, basically the alphabet soup in Washington, right? Um, you have to abide by those laws as well. So that's a poor set of laws. They, administrative regulations carry the same weight and effect as if it was passed by Congress or the state legislature, right? So they have the same weight and effect. Now, they go at it a little bit differently. So at the federal level, and that's what we're gonna focus on, um, when an agency, let's say the EPA wants to um, limit how much pollution you can discharge into a waterway, right? So they come up with a proposed regulation, a proposed law basically. And it gets published in what's called the federal register. Right? So you can go click on the Federal Register and you can see all the proposed um, rules and regulations. Once it's published in the Federal Register, and you do this online now, the public, anyone, anyone, you can do this if you want to, um, is permitted to comment and attempt to persuade changes in the rules. So depending on what the, the, the regulation is, you have between 30 and 60 days. And if it's a really serious uh, major change, you have 180 days uh, to comment on the rule. And then what happens is the agency is supposed to then take all the comments, read through them, respond to the comments, and adjust their rule and adjust everything according to how the comments came in. And, and the idea is like people who, who comment are usually experts, right? And they'll, they'll probably like say, you know, this is a problematic for this or whatever reason, right? And so the, the agency will rethink it and they'll reword it if they want to. Um, but regardless, um, after they've revamped it and it's gone through the whole process again, um, it gets codified in what's called the Code of Federal Regulations, the CFR. Um, the CFR, it's not, it's just, it's done by um, date of regulation imposed. Um, it, there, there are versions where it's, um, like you can look up environmental regulations and all of the EPA regulations to be there. Uh, but usually the CFR is just, well, EPA had this regulation on the 7th, the SEC passed this regulation on the 8th, and like, they're just kind of all cluster fucked. Um, but you are expected to know all of those and abide by all of those at the same time. Then we have another source of criminal law, court opinions. All right, so the example uh, I give is, is, is Bond versus United States. The, 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 the case I discussed when I talked about the Socratic method, um, in the previous class, right? Court opinions also carry the weight of statutes, right? So if a judge makes a decision and says, well, intent now means this, that's the law, right? So you're supposed to know every court opinion that comes out as well. So not just the Supreme Court, but the state Supreme Court, and usually the Court of Appeals of the state, the Court of Appeals, of your um, circuit that you're in. Um, trial court, yeah, they don't, they're, they're not really binding, but like anything above the trial court is. Um, so that's where we can get more criminal law from. So if we take statutes, regulations, and court opinions, we take them together, they create what's called the elements of criminal liability. Now criminal liability you all thought you were gonna get away from math. <laughs> You're wrong. Because criminal liability is best thought of as an equation. And what we'll be doing in the next classes, next class, is we will look at some different examples and then we will go through a couple of equations. And then we'll turn transition and look at constitutional limits on criminal law. As always, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me at dclayatelmeyer.edu. 
and I'm more than happy to meet with anybody virtually uh, during office hours or answer any questions that you may have. That being said, um, I hope you have a great day and I will see you soon.